This is a this is the best available version of the Bruder film. It's called the Costello Combined Cut. You can find it available for free as individual frames or as a complete sequence on assassination science and elsewhere. Uh, John uh, restored uh, some of the frames. He, he, even in the MPI version, they had frames out of order. He took out uh, pin cushion and aspect ratio distortion. This is available for free, no copyright entanglements, no sixth floor or any of that. There were, of course, numerous indications that something was wrong with the film from the beginning. Abraham Zapruder, after all, had observed that he began filming when the motorcade came up Houston and started to turn on to Elm and filmed continuously until it just, the motorcade disappeared under the triple underpants. Oh, we have this huge gap. You see it's just barely reaching the intersection and then all of a sudden the limousine is at the, at, at, at the uh, Stellan's freeway sign. There were other indications something was wrong. Look at the string of bystanders standing there looking on. Unlike every other location in Dallas, they're not weeping and screaming enthusiastically. They're just standing there passively looking on as though the president and Jackie were not actually there before them. And indeed, that appears to be the case, that that particular foreground was filmed when the pilot car passed and then was added when they revised the film to create what we have available now using the sophisticated techniques of optical printing and special effects whereby you can combine any foreground with any background. In addition, notice Mary Mormon and Jean Hill, Jean in the bright red coat, Mary beside her, for Mary was taking photographs, <coughs> Jean was with her Polaroid. Jean was coating them with a preservative. They both stepped out into the street in order to take. Jean calls over, hey, Mr. President, look over here. We want to take your picture. When Mary Mormon was being interviewed by Gary Mack, a.k.a. Dunkel, for a documentary, Mary repeatedly kept stepping out into the street because that was what she had actually done. But Gary talked to her about they didn't want that. And when they finally, you know, they finally had a, a take where she didn't actually step into the street, he said, we'll use that. I mean, the duplicity involved here is simply overwhelming. And there have been, you know, uh, Individuals who would have been presumably uh, uh, authorities and custodians who have been deliberately uh, obfuscating and distorting the truth. I'll, I'll continue with that thing. Uh, another uh, indication, of course, which Noel Twyman discerned was that the rear head turns are much too fast. Indeed, he hired a professional tennis player to determine how fast someone could turn their head from back to front and front to back, and he discovered that Greer is turning his head twice as fast as is humanly possible, which doesn't sound like much until you realize it turns a, a four-minute mile into a two-minute mile. And now if I can return to the slide set. So there's been lots of controversy, lots of discussion, but that, and, and with regard to the turn, you know, why there's a big gap, but we know now it's because William Greer swung out too widely. He mistook the frontage road in front of the book depository for Elm Street. Nearly hit a concrete abutment. Hit Roy Truly, Oswald's supervisor, is crystal clear about this. Then he had to pull back into the center to get the vehicle back in line. But while well, that was a, an obvious uh, gap, it was by no means the, the only significant feature of what actually happened on Elm Street, where, this is fun, where John Costello and I co-edit assassinationresearch.com, which is an online journal for, for the advanced study of the death of JFK, and where John put together what happened on Elm Street, the eyewitnesses speed, which runs 100 and 120 pages of just a compilation of what the witnesses actually said. So if you want to get a better idea of what happened on Elm Street, you read what the witnesses said, and you'll find, as I proceed, I'll be talking about what many of them reported. Here, of course, is the official scenario of three shots fired from the sixth floor 
of the Detroit Depository building by allegedly a, a, a Marine Corps shooter who was actually quite a mediocrity. I was a, I used to supervise marksmanship training and, and recruit training in San Diego where I had 15 DIs and 300 recruits under my command. Oswald scored 212 in 1957, which was reasonable shooting. I fired 212 myself. The next year, now, however, 58, he didn't show up at the rifle range, which is extraordinary because there's a general order that every Marine from the lowest ranking private to the highest ranking general, the commandant of the Marine Corps himself, must qualify with a rifle every year, which told me he was on some special assignment. And then the following year, in, in 1959, he barely qualified with a 191, and that was probably a gift from the pits. I mean, he was such a bad shot that he frequently missed the target altogether, and they'd wave a flag known as Maggie draw Maggie's Drawers, which Oliver Stone mentioned in his magnificent work of JFK. Based upon extensive research on the medical evidence, and where I had the benefit of collaborating with the best experts, including a world authority on the human brain, who was also an expert on wound ballistics, a PhD in physics, who was also an MD and board certified in radiation oncology, was an expert on the interpretation of x-rays. We have been able to ascertain that Jack was hit at least four times. He was in the back.